welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair. Parent Dunn is the publisher of Palimpsest Press, a local independent literary press. Amy has a degree in English literature and language from the University of Windsor and a graduate certificate in publishing from Ryerson University. She has over 15 years of experience editing fiction and is the literary fiction editor at Palimpsest. She's on the board of Literary Arts Windsor and the programming committee for Bookfest Windsor. She lives in Windsor with her husband and two children and her pronouns are she and her. In 2012, she became a publishing assistant at Palimpsest Press, which had been founded by Dawn Crescent in 2000. Just over a year later, she bought the press and became its publisher with Dawn remaining as poetry editor and designer. Palimpsest Press is a small independent publishing house that publishes beautifully designed books of poetry, fiction, and literary nonfiction. And the press celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's good to have you here. So congratulations on shepherding Palimpsest to its third decade. Did you imagine yourself as a publisher before taking it on? Um, absolutely not. <laughs> Um, I actually wanted to be a writer. I was a wannabe writer um, back in the day. And I didn't really know anything about publishing until I had to go back to school um, when I was 36. And uh, I had my company closed and I needed to find something new. So I went back to, uh, back to school. I went to Ryerson. Um, they have a publishing program. And it wasn't until uh, then that I had any idea of being behind the scenes um, in writing, as opposed to being a writer. I mean, you wear a lot of hats as the publisher in Palimpsest. Can you tell us a bit about your roles are in the press? Um, certainly. Um, the, the biggest role would have to be the acquiring um, an editing role. Um, that takes up the bulk of my time. Currently, we're going to be publishing nine books this year. So, when you're acquiring books, you're working three years ahead at a minimum. Um, usually, yeah, usually about three years between when we sign a person and when we um, when we actually publish the book. So there's a lot of um, reading of submissions going on, um, choosing, acquiring the author, getting the contracts all together, and then actually the actual editing process usually takes about a year, year and a half. And then we move on to the design and layout phase, um, at which and there's sales teams that we have to coordinate with and uh, marketing strategies that have to be plotted out. That that usually comes about a year before the book is published, year to six months, and then six months before the book is actually published, everything is we're working on getting everything um, marketing wise put together and ready to go out. Um, so those are, it's, we work very season by season, um, but those are the things that are constantly happening during the process. So if I'm working on my, for example, my fall season that's coming up this fall, um, it's already finished to us. My spring season, which is, the books aren't even printed yet, it's technically over with, and we're already planning three years in the future. So I was just interested in your, your spring 2020 season. Is that what you, you, you mean? Um, and you're saying they're not printed yet, right? Is that because of the current situation with the pandemic? Or It is. We were very lucky. We got two of our books published before. Um, two of the books actually were at the printer. So in order for a book to be published in April, it needs to be at the printer by about January. Um, so fortunately, we had those two books at the printer. No problem. Um, they actually got delivered a week before March break, um, before everything closed down. So we actually had them at our distributor. I have them here at home. 
Um, so those folks were actually able to go to the bookstores, were able to go as planned. But that was only two out of the five that we were having this spring season. Um, I'm just finishing up our fiction, which the printer for that book is actually still open. Um, we were just delayed more due to design issues for that one. Um, but my third book of poetry by local author Dorothy uh, Mahoney, that one actually we're waiting for the printer to open back up. We, uh, we just finished the, um, the final copy of the cover, the final copy of the interior proof, and I'll be sending it to them. They can do the pre-proof, but they can't actually do the printing yet. And my, my fifth book, that author, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on there. <laughs> we haven't heard much from that author, so uh, I'm a little worried about him. I know he, uh, he was traveling in, in the States, so I think we got to find out what's happening with that guy. <laughs> so he's really taking but, uh, social should... distancing seriously. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. we're looking at, um, at the earliest, we're looking at June releases for those books, which would normally have come out in May. Um, more than likely, it'll be July. And of course, you can't do the regular book tours with your authors nope. right now. Yeah. We've been lucky. The two that have been printed, they've been participating in a lot of online readings. Um, David Lee, who is um, an author from BC, he applied for and um, got a spot on Canada Performs, which was huge for us. Um, and he did a live reading and Q&A. Um, it was really interesting. We had over 270 uh, people visit, which would be more than an average launch. <laughs> so that was, that was quite something. Um, and I've been selling from the website. So his book has actually been doing incredibly well, considering there are no bookstores open. His, um, I hit the post office once a week and we're, we're mailing out books. So if anybody wants a book, feel free to go to the website. <laughs> That's awesome news. Can you tell us a little bit about the Anstruther imprint? Am I saying that properly? You are. Um, Anstruther Books. So we have two different strands of poetry at Palimpsest. We were um, conceived as a po poetry press. And so we still have our one strand, which is our lyrical traditional poetry. And then Anstruther started two, three years ago. And um, it was an attempt to attract a different type of author. Um, we had been attracting one kind of author for a long time and we wanted to branch out a little bit and show that we could do things differently, show that we could appeal to emerging authors, perhaps a younger set of authors. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, an imprint focused on millennials um, and millennial writing, but not necessarily just youth writing. Um, we do have authors that don't necessarily fit that criteria, but the main point of the imprint is to focus on the 21st century and the idea of what it's like to come of age in an era where technology, our lives are so infused with technology that we're, we're constantly, where we're constantly attached to our technology. And um, that's really where the answer other press comes from. It comes from that, this idea that we wanted to tap into what it means to be, to really reflect the 21st century. So uh, you are based here in Windsor, Essex. Um, what is it about this region that fuels your endeavors at Palimpsest? <laughs> um, for, the, for the company itself, um, there are a lot of benefits to being um, outside of Toronto. Um, we're finding authors that we wouldn't normally find um, who have something to say. There's um, financial benefits to not being in the city. Um, and so being outside of, of the main center, um, there are benefits to that uh, financially. Um, as far as what it means, it, it really means that we can showcase people who wouldn't necessarily be found. If you, you'll notice if you peruse like um, the CBC website or Quill Inquire, they tend to focus a lot of their effort on um, people in the big cities and it it really does mean that people from smaller towns or people from outside of those centers tend to get a little left behind a little forgotten about and one thing that we can do as regional publishers is really bring to the forefront the fact that 
great authors are all across the country. They're not in er only in urban centers, you know. Um, I literally publish authors from every province. <laughs> I think the only province we haven't hit yet is PEI, and we're working on we're working on the territories now. But they're really we have authors from every every part of the country, regional, urban. And it's, that's one nice thing about being a small press is that you can focus on bringing those voices out and, you, and not having to compete to get them. Um, especially Windsor, Windsor has an incredible amount of talent in it for being as small of a city as it, as it is. Um, there's no lack of talent here. So Palimpsest has now been owned by two women. Do you find that outlook influences your decisions and your working practice in any way? Do I find that being owned by women in, in influences how we choose our books? Is that basically what you're asking? You kind of cut sure. out on me a little. Um, I don't think so. Um, for As far as acquisitions go, we actually have two male editors um, and three female editors. I, I don't know that it, it does. The, about the only thing that it maybe informs is this idea that um, marginalized voices need to be heard. And, you know, if we start with just um, female voices tend to get overshadowed by the male voices in the literary community, for sure. Um, so we're conscious of that and, and we make sure that our list is, um, is balanced, both male and female. And then that led to realizing, especially early on when I took over the company, that we had a very unbalanced list when it came to um, people of color, um, indigenous people. We didn't, we just didn't have anybody. It was a purely white list. And when I took over, I noticed this and I said, this can't stand. We need to change, <laughs> we need to change that. And so I think just being a woman, you recognize that, you know, it, your own voice is not necessarily heard all the time. Um, who else's voices aren't being heard and how can we help that? How can we, um, change it so that other voices are being heard. Sorry, my dog is now goofing around in the background and distracting. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Canadian publishing industry is mostly collegial. So who in Canlet have been your mentors? Great question. Um, I actually belong to a group called the Literary Press Group. And um, that's a collective of publishers from across Canada. And so working with them, I've actually done a mentorship under Kitty Lewis um, from Brick Books. But I would say that Noelle Allen from Woolsack and Wynn has been a huge influence. Um, she, like me, purchased the company from somebody else and has really managed to um, make it her own, to put her own stamp on it and accomplish a great deal in the small amount of time that she, that she has owned it. Um, other people include Lee Nash from Invisible Publishing. Her marketing strategies um, blow me out of the water. She, she has an incredible reach um, and ability to um, access media across Canada and her books get recognized across Canada. So I, I tend to follow them closely on social media. Um, I, I know quite a few of them personally, and I'm able to reach out anytime I need to and just be like, uh, you know, this, this, well, for example, just now during the COVID, we normally send out um, advanced reading copies of our books. Um, nobody's there to receive them right now. So I reached out to um, Hazel Miller from Book Hug and Noel and Kitty, and I just said, how are, how are you guys approaching this situation? What are you doing with your arcs? And, you know, they shared what, what they've been doing, what strategies have been working best for them. And what's lovely about the Canadian um, publishing industry is that it's not competitive. It's very welcoming. And, you know, the books that I might choose are not the ones that they might choose. So there isn't a competition. There's really a sense of community with the publishers across Canada. Even um, Dan Wells here in, in Windsor has given me amazing advice. And, you know, I always think of him as my big brother. If I need something, I can go to him and ask him, how would Biblioasis handle this situation? Keeping in mind that he's, of course, you know, his company is 20 times the size of mine, but there's always little things that I can, I can pick and choose and I can 
use to, um, you know, bring more attention to my authors, create better situations for my authors, for my books. Great. So is there a one publishing tip or lesson maybe that you got early on as you took over that you've acquired so far? Oh, publishing lesson. Or um, a tip or... Um, I always have the, this one tip for authors that I, I'm sure people are getting tired of hearing, <laughs> but rejection has nothing to do with you as a writer. Um, rejection almost always has to do with what list does the, the company put out and does your book fall into that? Um, it has to do with how an editor approaches something. Um, it has to do with whether you're the right fit. And I think a lot of authors take rejection personally, and it's always the one thing that I, I try to emphasize over and over again is, A, small publishing houses, we only publish, I only publish nine books a year, and that's up from four when I took over. Um, the average small publishing house only releases between 12 and 18. So if they're getting like 300 submissions, you know, you can't take a rejection personally. It's possible that it just didn't fit, um, you didn't hit the right editor, there's sometimes I read a book and it's brilliant and I know I'm not the right editor for it and I have to pass on it because I would do it more harm than good. And so that's always my biggest thing is to let authors know, don't take rejection personally because it's not personal at all. So Palimpsest authors have, been, have won or been shortlisted for various prizes. What does that mean for your press when that happens? Oh, shortlist nominations, long list nominations and award wins are, Fantastic in a marketing sense. Obviously, I think that every book that we publish is, um, is a winner. Is there something about it that we love and that we put our full, um, our full marketing machine behind? But those long list nominations, the short list nominations, they give us a little bit more marketing power. Um, so for example, um, Claire Duplessis Eck, I don't know if you guys remember Clara from Book Fest Windsor a couple years ago. That book went on to win um, the Pat Lowther Memorial Award. That allowed her to be featured on the CBC and the Quill and Choir. Just name recognition. That gives the company name recognition. It gives our authors name recognition. Um, it usually leads to them getting offers from you know houses that can pay them better, <laughs> which I'm all for. Um, but it, it helps our marketing machine a little bit more if, um, you know, I can now approach a journal and be like, hey, we've published this person, they've won this award, we're now publishing this person, and they're just as awesome. They're more likely to take a look at that book, they're more likely to review the book, they're more likely to, you know, ask that author for an interview. So they, that's what nominations can, and wins can do for us. They just give us that little bit of publicity that makes us look a little bit more, um, it just gives us that boost, that marketing boost. Behind the scenes, is that um, problematic for um, supply of books and things like that? Or is it, was, would, did it work out okay for you? Um, it hasn't yet. Um, we do work on a reprint basis. So if a book starts to get low, we automatically reprint. Um, you know, you have to, there's a fine balance there between knowing when to reprint and when to hold off because there might be returns. So I can give, I can give a great example. This book didn't win an award, but it was released at Halloween and it had, it was kind of um, a spooky cover and it got purchased up really fast. And I suspected that it was Indigo and that they were making displays because it was a really cool cover made by um, Kate Hargreaves, one of the local um, designers here in town. Fantastic cover. And sure enough, we were like right there, we were gonna have to reprint. And I held off just long enough. And as soon as Halloween was over, we got about 200 books back. And it was, they were display material basically. Um, so it's, it, it's that kind of thing. Yes, you want to get recognition <laughs> and yes, you wanna win awards, but every now and then it, it leads to overproduction of books and there's nothing worse than having to pulp a book that uh, that always makes me sad <laughs> yeah. so what's your next project or are your next goals for the press what are you looking forward to oh, 
Um, next goals for the press. We're just, we're kind of in a, we've been in a growth period. And I think we're, we're looking for um, some stability right now. We're looking to, to hit a certain number of books. We've switched distributors in an attempt to um, reach a bigger audience. Um, we're definitely working on our marketing strategies, trying to get our name out there, trying to get uh, better recognized, which in turn is bringing in um, authors of more renown. So it's, we're, we're sort of in a, in a growth period, but at the same time, we're kind of leveling off at the same time. And I, I think that that's our, our goal there is to, to rest a little bit, um, make sure the company is, is working, um, just trying to establish a good foundation before we start to grow again. Um, Cause we have been, it's been a growth and learning curve for, since 2015. And uh, I think we need a little bit of stability and a little bit of calmness to like, stop, take stock, make sure that we're still publishing the things that, um, that mean a lot to us and that we're not kind of veering off trend at all. Amy, thank you so much for your time and for sharing us. Again, congratulations on the anniversary of the press. And we really hope that you're sending out authors on the road for, sh for real soon. Oh. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.